Bayes' theorem is a simple little mathematical equation. It's so simple, in fact, that it's been discovered and rediscovered several times throughout human history. The first time I saw Bayes' theorem, I thought to myself, well, the math is simple enough, but it was a revelation when I finally figured out what it meant. Bayes' theorem has risen to sort of a social movement. You'll see college students walking around with Bayes' theorem printed on their t-shirts. Well, since Bayes' theorem is not about the math, but about the meaning, why don't we take an intuitive look at Bayes' theorem without the math? This is so simple, you're going to wonder why someone hasn't shown this to you before. Picture a dinner plate, completely covered with peas. Now, each pea on this dinner plate represents a way that the universe could possibly be, given all that we know. Each P contains all of the facts that we believe to be true and all of the entanglements between those facts. If some fact is absolutely certain, it's contained in every P on the plate. So, for example, every P on the plate representing a conceivable universe contains the truths that butter melts in a hot pan and that helium has two protons. The difference between all of these P's is that they each contain different conceivable ideas that we don't know to be true yet. Each P represents the way that the universe could possibly be. Some of the P's may contain the idea that my team will win the Super Bowl this year. Some of the P's may have my team eliminated in the playoffs. Some of the P's have physicists discovering a new subatomic particle. In other P universes, no such particle exists. All the P's contain the same verified knowledge, but each P is different from the rest because it contains propositions that haven't been verified yet. None of the P's contain false data. If a P contained a known falsehood, it would have been already eliminated from our plate. A false P is not a way that the universe could possibly be. If something is impossible in that imagined universe, then we know that that universe is bogus. We couldn't possibly be living in that universe. There's no possible universe P on my plate where a giant leprechaun washes my car every week. Now, there may be an infinite number of P's, at least as far as we are concerned, it's infinite because there are so many possibilities. Our beliefs and expectations are guided by the possible universes that we think are on our plate. We have an intuitive sense of the probabilities. If someone were to ask me, are you going to win the silver medal in the men's figure skating competition in this year's Olympics? I'd have to tell him, well, there's pretty much no chance of that happening. Now, why would I say that? It's because very few of my possible universes would have events tied together in such a particular way that they would produce that kind of an outcome. Given my background knowledge, which is all the things that I already know about my universe, there's relatively few of these possible universes where that would happen. I'm 54 years old. I'm a terrible ice skater. In order for this to happen, I'd have to take up ice skating, which I'm not planning on doing, and pretty much all of my opponents from every competing country would have to die in plane crashes simultaneously. For me to win the silver, anyway. All sorts of complicated sequences of events would have to be caused leading up to my winning an Olympic medal. And although nothing is totally impossible, fewer of all possible universes will produce these events compared to the number of more general universes that aren't required to be that specific. Let's look at the P's. If I go around my plate and collect up all the P's that represent universes where I win a silver medal, there's much fewer of those. If I pull them together into a group, it's this group here with a white circle around it, I have a much smaller group than the rest of the universes. Picture the white 
circle as a little fence around the area, um, dividing those peas from the rest. In the more general universes, where I don't win a silver medal, we don't require events to be connected together as much. So there's more of them. What if I ask a question that goes the other way? Let's say you sit outside on a lawn chair on a clear evening looking up at the sky. Well, over the course of several hours, what are the chances that you're going to see a meteor or shooting star? Well, I used to see a fair number of them when I used to go to high school football games. It turns out that the sun has a lot of chunks of matter orbiting around it at different angles. And on a given evening, a fair number of them collide with the Earth. So if I pull all these universe peas together, where a shooting star makes itself visible inside of several hours, I have quite a large group compared to the universes where this doesn't happen. Now what about a situation where you get some new evidence added to the background information that you already have? Let's say someone comes up to you out of the blue and asks you, did your Aunt Betty used to be a nightclub singer? Well, you might be a little stunned, and you might say, no, probably not, not my Aunt Betty. Now, why would you say this? Well, let's say you have no evidence that your Aunt Betty used to be a nightclub singer. So, being a nightclub singer is not a typical hobby. So, right off the bat, you wouldn't expect this. Then, on top of that, you know your Aunt Betty. I mean, she's not a flamboyant person. You could see her maybe making quilts or collecting figurines, but she doesn't seem like the kind of person who would have been a nightclub singer. So the reason you say it is because there's fewer universes where Aunt Betty would have been a nightclub singer and then circumstances would have conspired to make her the person she is today. So the circle of possible universes where Aunt Betty was a nightclub singer, given our background knowledge, is smaller than the total number of all possible universes by quite a bit, but not nearly as small as the set of universes where I could have won an Olympic silver medal. Now let's add some intrigue. Let's say you're looking around in your mother's attic for something, and you come across a box of old photographs. You start looking at the photographs, they appear to be from the 1950s, and they appear to show your Aunt Betty singing in a nightclub. Well, what are you to make of this? Here's where Bayes' theorem has something to say. So I've drawn a circle around all the P's that represent universes where I would have thought my Aunt Betty would have been a nightclub singer. This represents my prior beliefs. Now I've drawn a red circle around all the P universes where I could have likely discovered a box of photographs in my mother's attic of my Aunt Betty singing in a nightclub. It's a slightly smaller group of universes because I think it's even less likely that this box of photographs would have turned up. You'll notice that the two circles don't overlap exactly. What this does is it creates four regions. If you look at the circles as a fence dividing the P's, there's four groupings of P universes here, A, B, C, and D. Now the P's in region A represent universes where my Aunt Betty is not a nightclub singer and I didn't find this box of photographs. It's outside of both circles. Region B represents all the universes where my Aunt Betty was a nightclub singer, but I didn't find that box of photographs. That's because there's universes where my Aunt Betty could have been a nightclub singer, but no photographs were taken, or I never discovered the photographs. Region C represents all the universes where my Aunt Betty was a nightclub singer, and I did find that box of photographs. And Region D represents universes where I found those photographs, but my Aunt Betty was not a nightclub singer. We have to allow for that. Maybe I was mistaken about the photographs. Maybe I looked at the photograph and thought it was my Aunt Betty, but it was someone else. Now here's where we can apply Bayes' theorem. If you stuck with me this far, this is easy. 
Applying Bayes' theorem just means that all of region A goes away here because we don't live in any of those universes. We found those photographs, so we don't live in any universe where the photographs were not discovered. Likewise, region B goes away because that's, those are universes where the photographs were not found. And we know we don't live in that universe anymore. We only live in the universe represented by the red circle. So let's take this all away. We're only left with regions C and D. These are the only true universes anymore. Now since our plate contains a possibly infinite or almost infinite number of P's, we can just zoom in on this and the C and D region become our new reality, our new dinner plate. Now here's what our possible realities look like. C is the region where my Aunt Betty was a nightclub singer and I found the photographs. D is the region where my Aunt Betty was not a nightclub singer, but I found the photographs. And now region C has gotten much larger compared to D. So after finding this evidence, the photographs, the idea that my Aunt Betty was a nightclub singer is much more probable than it was. It takes up more than half the plate. So that's what Bayes' theorem is all about. It may not look profound yet, but we're just getting started. You can use Bayes' theorem forwards and backwards. You can use it to predict something that's going to happen, or you can use it to calculate the probability that something did happen based on the evidence that you have. So why do we have to turn this into a mathematical equation? Well, sometimes you want the exact numbers. Sometimes it's surprising when you see what comes out of it. And when we're talking about our doctors, I don't want them telling me that I have a 95% chance of having thyroid cancer when my actual chances of having this disease are only 6%. And I'm not just making that example up. So let's go on to look deeper into Bayes' theorem. I think you're going to find this exciting.